Welcome to the University of Illinois Extension Professional Tick and Tick-Borne Disease Prevention Training. During this training program, you will learn about a wide range of topics related to ticks and tick-borne diseases, including tick anatomy, specific species of ticks in Illinois, how to tell if and for how long a tick was feeding, the types of habitats and geographic locations of these tick species, as well as how they reproduce and when they are active outdoors, how to prevent tick bites, and how tick-borne disease impacts public health broadly. By the end of this program, you should be able to identify tick species from photo submissions. Each module will assist in your ability to do so. In this module, we will introduce you to basic background information, tick anatomy, and life stages. By the end of the module, you should be able to differentiate between life stages and use terminology about the anatomy of ticks. Now let's take a look at how ticks are classified. This training is focused on the identification of hard ticks, since the main species that transmit pathogens to humans and animals in the Midwest and Northeast of the United States are in this family. The soft ticks have different feeding patterns and anatomical differences that we will not cover. Now let's take a look at the different life stages. Ticks have four different life stages. Egg, larva that only have six legs, nymphs with eight legs, and adults also with eight legs. Once the egg hatches, the tick needs to feed in order to progress to the each of the next life stages. After feeding, the tick drops off the host and then molts into the next life stage. Adult females need to feed an additional time in order to produce and release eggs into the environment and to continue the life cycle. The three different mobile life stages of the tick are larva, nymph, and adult. The size of the tick can be one way of differentiating between life stage. This illustration by the CDC shows proportional sizes of the mobile life stages for the black-legged, lone star, and American dog ticks. Larvae are smaller than the head of a pin. Nymphs are about the size of a poppy seed. And adults are larger than the previous stages, but males are smaller than females on average. Sizes of adults vary between species. Beyond size differences, the amount of body covered by the sputum is used to differentiate between male and female adult ticks. The female sputum only covers a small part of the top, or the dorsal surface, of the tick. This enables the abdomen of the female to expand during feeding. Males have a sputum that extends the whole length of their body. It is not possible to determine the sex of a nymphal or larval tick through visual means. All nymphal and larval ticks have a sputum that only cover a part of the dorsal surface. Sometimes it can be hard to differentiate between an adult female and a nymphal tick just based on a photo. This is where the information provided at, with the tick at submission can be critically important. This will be covered in detail in module four. In the process of feeding, ticks can infect their hosts with a pathogen and ticks can become carriers of pathogens through vertical transmission from mother to egg or through feeding on an infected host known as horizontal transmission. When feeding on a host, ticks secrete a small amount of saliva that contains anesthetic and anticoagulant properties along with possible pathogens. Let's take a look at the anatomy of ticks. This portion of the module will introduce you to new terminology. We will also go over more tips on how to differentiate between life stages and sexes. When trying to identify the species of a tick, you will be looking for different anatomical features in three areas. The head, the body, and the legs. It is made up of the mouth parts, the head, the capitulum, which include the palps and the hypostome, and the basis capitulum, which is at the base of the head where the mouth parts attach. When trying to identify the tick species, you should be focusing on the shapes and proportions of these features. For example, what is the shape of the capitulum overall? Is it long and slender or shorter and more triangular? 
Next, look at the proportion of the mouth parts to the basis capitulum. Are the mouth parts much longer or about equal in proportion to the basis capitulum? Here is an illustration of the differences in shape and proportion of the mouth parts. Are the palpi short and stubby or long and slender? The basis capitula is the base of the head. The two shapes you will be looking for are hexagonal or rectangular. The hypostome is the part of the tick that is inserted into the host to feed. While it may be hard to view in the photos, it can be used to help differentiate between species. The most that you may be able to see in a photo is the width of the hypostome versus the width of the palps. Is it wider or is it thinner? If you start to identify ticks using a stereoscope, you will also want to look at the dentition, or the number of rows of teeth, or little razor sharp parts on the side. You would count over from the midline of the hypostome. You would also want to observe if the end of the hypostome is pointed or blunt. Certain characteristics on the body of the tick can be used in identification. First, let's look at the sputum. The sputum is a hard shield on top or on the dorsal surface of a tick. Observe the color, pattern, and shape. These characteristics vary between species. Some species have a solid colored sputum called inornate, and others have pattern called ornate. What is the shape of the sputum? Is it more like an oval or a baseball diamond? Does it cover the entire top of the body or only go part of the way down? Next is the allosputum. This is the area of the body that expands as the tick feeds. Think about its proportion in relation to the sputum. This can be important for feeding signs that will be covered more in Module 3. Festoons are small areas separated by short grooves on the posterior dorsal surface of a tick's body. When you have the actual tick to look at, you would also want to count the number of festoons if they are present. The number of festoons varies by species. Exodes ticks are the only ones that do not have festoons. The anal groove is a small depression around the anus on the ventral surface of the tick. The groove may be below the anus or may extend around in front of the anus. Exodes genus ticks are the only ones that have an interior anal groove. The next two characteristics are generally not visible from photos. Eyes can be either present or absent. Here you can see them in this photo of a brown dog tick. The spiracle plates are on the ventral surface of the tick below the last pair of legs. This is how the tick exchanges gases or respires. The spiracle plates can have either large goblets or small goblet spiracles within. The large goblet spiracles appear bumpy while the small goblets appear smooth. Now, for the legs. As we discussed earlier, ticks are arachnids, but the larvae have six legs. As they molt into nymphs and adults, they grow an additional pair of legs, giving them eight. The color of the legs will vary based on the species. For example, Exodus scapularis have black legs, while Amblyoma americanum have brown legs. The coxa and trochanters are generally not observable in enough definition within photos, but they are important when identifying a tick with a microscope. The coxa is the part of the leg that attaches to the body on the bottom or the ventral surface of the tick. The trochanter is the part of the leg that attaches to the coxa. The coxa are numbered starting closest to the head with one, two, three, four. When looking at the coxa, you should pay attention to the internal spur, which is closer to the midline. An external, or farther from the midline, spur. Are these spurs present on one or all of the coxa? How long are the spurs? And are the spurs sharp or blunt? 
On the trochanters, a spur may be present or absent depending on the species. Again, neither coxa nor trochanters will generally be used for photo submission identifications. You have reached the end of module one. In this module, you have learned about the anatomy of ticks and how to differentiate between tick life stages. By this point, you should be able to recognize and use terminology related to tick anatomy. This should allow you to differentiate between life stages of different species, as well as use that terminology about the anatomy of ticks to help identify tick species.